Kia ora and welcome to Wellywood Wargaming. My name is Damon and we're here to discuss more Necromunda content. In this episode, um, I'm going to be discussing campaigns, campaign structure, arbitration and the various different things um, that you can do with Necromunda beyond just playing one-off games. <clears throat> so, what is a campaign in Necromunda? Basically, if you're completely new to the game, you could play Necromunda in a one-off setting. Um, playing a one-off game that doesn't really have any consequences, win or lose. Um, whereas a campaign is completely, um, uh, you know, your, your fighters build and gain experience, you gain um, stats, you gain new skills, you gain new equipment, weapons, war gear, etc. in a campaign, and you will also um, gain injuries, things like that, um, as well as alliances, and a whole, whole, whole massive host of extra stuff that there is to Necromunda, which is only really available in a campaign setting. Um, now campaigns are best played with more people, um, you, you can of course play one with just maybe two players but um, I would say that they were definitely much more fun played with more people. Now of course if you live in an area that doesn't have many Necromunda players then, um, then it's a bit more difficult, maybe you could just play it with a, a family member or something like that but I can definitely tell you that campaign play is really how Necromunda should be played in a lot of ways. Now. <clears throat> Not to get into the um, specifics too much, but there are currently four main types of campaign that Games Workshop have written for Necromunda. Um, the first one, and most commonly used, is the Dominion campaign. Now, just to give you an overview of all these four campaigns' structures, the first one, the Dominion campaign, um, it revolves around territory. Um, so you start off with a settlement, and you will lose and gain territories off the other players in the in the campaign. Um, some of those territories are generic. Um, some of them give you um, monetary boons, give you more credits. Some of them give you um, like hired scum, for example. Um, and they all have different um, pros and cons. Some of them are gang specific, so they might actually um, only give you extra boons depending on which gang you are. But the long and short of it is that you're you're going out there into into a, a sort of uncharted part of the hive maybe, and you're you're trying to conquer territory um, and trying to fight and win it off each other. So that's the Dominion campaign, kind of in a nutshell. Um, the next one is the Law and Misrule campaign, which I think came out with the um, the Book of Judgment. Now. This one's actually very, very similar to the Dominion campaign. The only, the only difference is, instead of territories, you're using something called rackets. Now, rackets um, are rackets, basically. So they're different uh, monopolies that you might have on certain businesses, etc. And in instead of the boons that you would get from territories, you're now getting things like Xenos beast trafficking. You're getting things like outhive trade routes. Uh, trade routes. You're getting things like um, guild bonds, for example, and these have very similar um, drawbacks and very similar positives as well. So they might be just credits, they might give you a pet, for example, like the Xenos Beast Trafficking can just give you a pet, which is quite cool. Um, now in my experience, the, uh, the rackets are kind of a little bit more interesting than the territories, but we'll get into more detail on that soon. But essentially, the Law and Misrule campaign and the Dominion campaign are basically the same. You're just using rackets instead of territories. Um, and that's those two. The next one you've got is, of course, um, the Uprising campaign. Now, the Uprising campaign centers around a hive gone into um, a cult uprising, basically a, a chaos cult uprising, to be more specific. Um, this one's a little bit more different in that you're still essentially, you know, you're trying to win. Um, and you're trying to conquer the other gangs, but this time you have a really interesting mechanic in that you have starvation. Now, starvation means that you have to scrap for meat, in this case, um, obviously as a vegan it would be beans, um, but uh, meat is the, is the thing in the Uprising campaign. So, with meat, um, you know, your, your players, your, your gangers can starve if you're not feeding them properly and you, and you gain uh, extra meat from, from winning scenarios, etc. as well. Now that's basically the Uprising campaign. You'll notice already that there are quite a lot of similarities between these three so far in terms of the structure. Um, 
the last one is the Outlander campaign. Now that one came out in the book of Outcast. The interesting thing about this one is instead of rackets, instead of um, the, the, the um, territories, you've now got something which is um, quite interesting in that you're using um, actual buildings and resources and stuff now. So you've got to build, build your own um, settlement in this one and it's the, the good thing about this one is it's kind of encouraging those of us to actually start building physical terrain for Necromunda as well to represent what's what's being played in the campaign um, but again essentially it's still a win or lose kind of um, you you're only going to do well if you're winning games now that the basically I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of give you my thoughts on the problem with Games Workshop's um, campaign systems as written. Um, they're all very similar in that there is only reward for those who are winning games um, and there is little reward for those who are losing games. Um, you're gaining injuries, you're losing fighters. Those who win the games, however, are getting lots more money, they're getting much more resources, they're getting better equipment and it ends up being a bit of an arms race. Now for me, playing Necromunda back in the day, the core difference between new Necromunda and old Necromunda and the thing that I dislike the most about current Necromunda rules as written is that there is too much money in the game. There are too many credits and the equipment is probably too good too. Um, so thematically I think the uprising uh, campaign is the one that interests me the most um, so that's definitely um, a good one to think about but now what you can do um, and what we do here in Wellington is we hybridize these campaigns and take bits out of each and take bits out and put back put bits in um, to make these campaigns a bit sort of more balanced I suppose um, and make them slightly more narrative driven as well because I think that's a big part of what makes Necromunda cool really is being able to add some fluff and fun and story into it. Now you might have a an arbitrator in your group who's not particularly open-minded and just wants to play the rules as written and, that, and that's fine um, but it will get boring pretty fast I think if you're not at least um, trying to explore and expand on some of these ideas um, so I would definitely recommend <coughs> um, looking into the different ways of being able to adapt and, and change these, these campaign structures to, to suit your, your group's needs, basically. Um, and that comes through trial and error, basically. Um, we've been running consecutive campaigns pretty much two every year, I would say, here in Wellington for the last four years or so. And they keep getting better and better. Um, we started out with the Dominion campaign as written and um, it was it was fun you know but the trouble with the Dominion campaign and the other three as well to be honest is that it becomes an arms race and those who are doing very well the the ball just keeps rolling and they do better and better and better and those at the bottom of the pile tend to just get worse really um, sadly that's kind of the way that these campaigns are set up um, so you know we added a few house rules a few mechanics to make to make things a bit fairer, I suppose, and a bit more engaging and fun for those that aren't um, just winning every single game. Um, we limit the cheese, we limit the, the spam lists, we limit the um, meta type of play because that, that's reserved for the 40k players. It's not for Necromunda, in my opinion. Um, Necromunda is not a competitive game. It is a narrative game, and it belongs in that setting. I think if you're trying to play Necromunda in a competitive way, then play something else, play chess. Um, play poker I don't know but like Necromunda is is similar to Mordheim in a lot of ways if any of you have played that it's about building narrative and fluff around your gang and getting really attached to those fighters and really feeling the pain when they when they die and when you lose them um, and that's part of what's so beautiful about this game but back to the actual campaign stuff um, there is a, a, a website called Goonhammer um, shout out to Goonhammer and those folks out there. Uh, now we've taken a few um, ideas from their, um, from some of their campaign stuff as well and added it to our current campaign. 
and it's worked really, really well. So I definitely recommend checking out Goonhammer. Um, of course, there are also um, the Bad Zone sort of things as well. And there's loads and loads of fan-made material out there as well on Yak Tribe and whatnot that you can find to add to your campaign and make it more fun, more fluffy. Um, but generally speaking, um, we've managed to tailor our campaign here in Wellington to really make everybody who's involved feel involved and not feel like they're losing out just by losing a game. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the things that we do now, and this is just, you know, this is just based on my experience. I've played a lot. I've played a lot of Necromunda and, um, and it, like I've said, we've tailored this experience to our, to our gamers and found that this really works now. But one of the things we do now is we don't actually have post-battle actions anymore. So, um, well, not really anyway. We can still do medical escorts and stuff like that. But we now have a payday each Friday. Um, so instead of getting, so if you play, say, three games in a week and someone plays one game in a week, you're at no, you don't really get as much of an advantage as if you did, uh, you know, if, if you played a Dominion game, for example, so people's lives are um, complicated. Someone might be a parent and they might only be able to play one game every fortnight. That's realistic, right? And there might be someone who, who has a lot more time on their hands that can play three games a week. We don't want to punish people for wanting to play more, but we also don't want to punish the people who aren't being able to play as much. So what we do now is we have a set payday every single week that we set up on Discord and we actually roll for everybody's income that week all together and the arbitrator, me or Selby in this case, will put that money into their bank accounts on Yak Tribe and boom, easy peasy, right? We also do the settlement rolls there as well, so you get your free juves or gangers there too. And we now do our trading post on there too. So this is really cool. Basically every week um, we have a trader that comes around with a selected amount of wares. So we have quite a limited selection that we randomly select using a bot um, that the trader brings around. And instead of this arms race sort of system, what we do now is based on gang rating, the lowest gang rating gets first pick at the trading post. So there might be, for example, a power sword, a web pistol, a couple of good things. There might be two stub guns, there might be some flak armor. There'll usually be about 10 to 15 items, depending on the amount of players in the group. But the lowest gang gets to pick first. So if you're banking on getting that one web pistol that's in there, but you're top of the pile, then you're probably not getting it. So this is a really good balancing mechanic in terms of getting equipment. You cannot buy any equipment outside of this trade trading post, basically. The other thing that we do, and this includes the black market as well, so we have one for the black market, one for the general um, trading post. We also have a, a smith, basically. So um, this, again, this is from Goonhammer's uh, Lost Zone um, idea. We, we, we decided to implement this one too. But we have um, a system called components, basically. Um, so instead of having loot crates, the generic loot crates that you'd get in the game, we now place loot crates that are full of components. Now these components can be saved and added up to buy house gear. So you can't just buy stuff off your house list anymore. You have to have the amount of components plus the credits to be able to get that stuff too. So win or lose, um, you, you could lose a game pretty badly, but you could still get components out of the game just by going for those loot crates if you know that you're going to get absolutely monstered, for example. And that works really well too. This campaign currently, I haven't lost a game, but I also haven't gained any components and I haven't got much equipment out of it too. Um, so I've just been quite lucky so far, but some of the other gangs have, have been storing all these components and buying all their gear and they're catching up with me as a result. Another thing that we do, <coughs> of course, is the um, resurrect, and this can be really good for new players. Now, new players can get really switched off the game if they get bullied and beaten in their first couple of games and they just don't enjoy it and they get a lot of injuries in a campaign their leader might die from a stub gun shot from a Jew you never know it happens so one thing you can do and this is a white dwarf article is the resurrection packages so there are some really cool fluffy ideas for bringing back a fighter and we, we limit this to one per campaign so if my leader dies for example game one 
I can use a resurrection package from about six different packages. The one that I'll just bring off the top of my head is the Revenant. So that player, um, you know, if they don't play, they lose, I think, strength or something like that. But if they play against the gang that committed the, you know, the atrocity against them, um, they get bonuses just for fighting that gang or that player that took them out of action, which is really cool and really fluffy. But there are a number of other ones as well um, that, I, that I'm not going to go into right now. Um, the other thing that we do uh, is, oh, yeah, the other thing that we do is we've basically decided now to bring in an inducement system, which is similar to Blood Bowl. So if anyone plays Blood Bowl, they'll know what I'm talking about. And instead of using gang rating, because the problem with gang rating is when you look at a gang, uh, when you look at a gang rating of a gang, it doesn't represent those fighters that are, it doesn't account for those fighters that are out, out, um, out with injury, for example. So your gang rating might be huge, but you might have three or four fighters that are actually in recovery and that's counting those fighters. So instead of doing that, we use crew rating. So crew rating would be your gang rating minus the fighters that are missing for that game. And that also extends to scenarios too. If there's a limit on the amount of fighters that you get in a scenario, we account that into the gang rating, uh, into the crew rating too. Now the difference between that crew rating dictates what you can get um, if you're the underdog in terms of inducements basically, just like Necromunda with star, uh, just like Blood Bowl with star players, you've now got um, Dramatis Personae, which are basically star players for Necromunda. So now, for, for example, if I was playing um, playing against the gang and there was a, a, a difference of about 400 credits in our um, starting crew rating, I would be able to take a, a tactics card for every 200 difference. I'd be able to take an underdogs card for every 400 and difference. Or I could use that money, uh, that, that's, that, ex, that excess credits to um, bring on some hired scum, a bounty hunter, or some set Dramatis Personae that are available to my gang. Now this is a really cool balancing mechanic and um, can be, can really swing games and, and, and help you win those games as well. So you're never going to be, um, you know, you're never going to just field three fighters. You're always going to have that that bonus, that buffer to be able to bring some cheap scum or whatever and just put them into the game and not really worry about them and play with a bit more Reckless Abandon, which is quite fun. And uh, currently in this campaign, that's working really, really well. Last campaign, we had a bounty system, so you'd actually have to pay money to, um, to, to get this kind of thing activated. But the problem with that is gaining the money in the first place. And if you're not winning those games, then you're not getting that money. So again, um, in summary, I would say, without going into too much detail with, within the individual campaign systems, is that there is too much money, there, is too, there are too many credits involved in winning, and there aren't, there aren't enough rewards for those losing. Um, so if you can find an, uh, an interesting way of balancing things a little bit more, like, like the methods that I've just spoken about, that will really help players engage and it will really keep people interested in the campaign without feeling sort of hard done by because you're going to have it's a game of dice at the end of the day you're going to roll a lot of ones you're going to have multiple players actually die outright in a game sometimes or sometimes you're going to you're going to roll sixes every game and every single person that goes out of action is going to roll double ones <clears throat> it happens so you never know but those are some of my pieces of advice um, from an arbitrator's perspective um, the other thing I would say involving scenarios as well um, is some of the scenarios, there are a lot of scenarios now. I mean, I can't remember how many, but I think there's over 80 scenarios, set scenarios. Now, it's all good and well using those set scenarios, and some of them are really, really cool. Some of them are very, very broken, and you really do have to read, um, read the details on those and just make sure that you're not playing something that's just uh, completely inherently broken. Um, and I won't name any off the top of my head, but there are a few that just aren't great. Some of them aren't great for starting gangs. Some of them are great later on in a campaign when you've got a bit, bit more of a beefier gang. Um, but with scenarios, you can also use the, um, the open hive war um, cards, which are really cool too, um, and create a randomly generated scenario with, um, 
with a different deployment each time, with a different objective each time, um, and with different perils and rewards as well, which are pretty cool. But again, with those, they tend to have too much money in them. Um, now, what we do every week in our campaign again, is we have three set scenarios randomly de determined each week to choose from. So uh, you will have those three in the group on the document every week to be able to choose from. Um, and you just, it's you, you and your opponent set a date to play and then you choose um, between you uh, which one you'd like to play. For example, I might say, yeah, I want to play this one. The other one might want to say, actually, no, I want to play that one. You just roll off for it and you just come to a gentleman's agreement on which one you're going to play. And it's just a nicer way of doing it um, because there's no, there's no, there's no roll off to determine scenario in our campaign, basically. Um, and I don't think there should be either, to be honest. But now that we've got that mechanic in terms of inducements, it, it, it balances things much more anyway. So you don't need to worry about being the underdog and making those rolls. Um, that's basically it. Um, the other thing I would recommend as an arbitrator is just having a really vivid and, and you know vivid imagination and, and conjuring up really cool scenarios and really cool stories and actually um, maybe doing a little newsletter like what happens each week, doing a little roundup of stuff uh, is really good. Um, currently our scenario is based in somewhere called Cotton Town um, and the, the mayor of Cotton Town is a beastman. Um, called Old Cottonmouth, for example, and we've got loads of fluff around that. There's a, there's a, one of my old gangs, the KTPD, is like a corrupt enforcer gang that kind of come back as bad guys, and we've got NPC characters. Um, we've even had a television show like a, like The Running Man, um, where we've done loads of interesting um, scenarios that, that I've just sort of thought up. And we've played like battle royale scenarios. We've played uh, dome runner some scenarios that are very similar similar to the Arnold Schwarzenegger film Running Man. Um, and we've had some really cool, fun, fluffy scenarios that have kept everybody interested and engaged. Um, so I def definitely recommend um, you know thinking outside the box really and and just adding your own spin on it. There's nothing to stop you making Necromunda what you want to make it. And I think that was how it was intended. You know when 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 Games Workshop sat down and wrote the rules for this, they left it open to your interpretation in terms of how you run campaigns, absolutely. And there are, there's so much more to it as well, written in the books as well. You've got subplots and you've got guild alliances and you've got all this extra stuff that you can throw in there too. Um, it's really fantastic to have so much support ongoing. And now, of course, very soon we've got the Ash Wastes stuff. So I imagine there's gonna be another campaign system in the Ash Wastes um, box set. I would imagine. Um, I'd be surprised if there wasn't, to be honest. And, that, um, and I'm really excited to see what happens with that as well. So um, there you have it. That's my two cents on campaigns and campaign systems for Necromunda. Um, I hope that answers some questions uh, for you people out there. And um, again, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you've got any more questions, please hit up in the comments. Um, and that's it for today. Um, peace.